From dancing naked ladies to Susie and trees. I speak for the trees. To plant diagrams that look like they come straight out of the little shop of horrors. Be Missy Mouse. This compact codex is probably the only book in the world that is famous, even though no one knows what it says. Welcome to The In-Between, I'm Carol Ann, and today we are diving into the centuries-old enigma of the Voynich Manuscript. In 1912, Wilfred Voynich, a rare book dealer from London, hurried home with his spoils from a deal that was nearly a decade in the making. Wilfred had gotten wind that the cash-strapped Jesuits were trying to cut a deal with the Vatican for some of the books in their library. And Wilfred was lucky enough and persistent enough to, nine years later, walk away with part of the lot. And lucky, too, because if the Vatican gets something, he usually never sees the light of day again. But don't think for a second that Wilfred is trying to save these books for the sake of all humanity. He's a business owner who needs to turn a profit. But little did he know that of all of the rare books he had just acquired, a little six by nine by two inch book that didn't even have a title would end up being the real treasure of the bunch. Not only would this little manuscript that he himself called an ugly duckling, come to one day bear his name, now known as the Voynich Manuscript. But it would also claim the title of the most mysterious manuscript in the world. Why is it so mysterious? Because no one has any idea what it says. Even after a century of scrutiny by the world's best cryptographers, ancient language experts, and even large language model AI computers, no one yet has cracked the code. It's roughly 240 pages, depending on how you count them, of diagrams with text that consists of a completely unknown language made up of a completely unknown alphabet. Who wrote it? Don't know. When was it written? Don't know. Where was it written? Don't know. But that's not to say that we don't have a few clues, thanks to old record keeping, modern technology, and good old fashioned detective work. So what do we know? Well, thanks to the archaic invention of snail mail, we know the book was first mentioned in the early 17th century around Prague, with its first recorded owner being Rudolf II, King of Hungary and Croatia, King of Bohemia, Archduke of Australia and Holy Roman Emperor. But I'm going to spare you the ownership play by play. Suffice it to say that the book is accounted for from around 1600 to 1680. Then it goes dark for a while and resurfaces again 220 years later in a collection of books the Jesuit order wants to sell to the Vatican. And that's when our friend Wilfred Voynich got his hands on it. And once Wilfred figured out that he had something pretty bizarre in his hands, he became fascinated by it and spent the better part of the next 20 years trying to decipher it. He's responsible for the first serious modern effort to decode the book by enlisting the talents of William Romaine Newbold, professor of intellectual and moral philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. Newbold also becomes fascinated by the manuscript and begins the first serious attempt at decoding the book in almost 300 years. And he thinks he's got it. He publishes a super complicated explanation of how he did it. And then he and Wilfred go on a national speaking tour to pat themselves on the back and explain to everyone else how he did it. And Wilfred is so convinced that whatever is in the book is of such monumental importance that before the decoded text is even published, he puts a price tag on the manuscript of $100,000. Surprisingly, no one steps up. And it doesn't take long before the academic community jumps all over William Newbold's translation as being, well, wrong. 
after Newbold's death, the second person to attempt decoding the manuscript, a World War I codebreaker named John Manley, reads Newbold's personal papers. Comes out and basically says, Newbold's explanation is crap. Long story short, in 1925, Voynich is contacted by William Friedman, known as the world's greatest codebreaker by historians, who was the top cryptographer for the U.S. Army during World War I. Wilfred Voynich dies in 1930, but leaves the manuscript to his wife Ethel and his secretary Anne, who keep it in a safe deposit box for the next 35 years. However, they too are dying to know what the book says and freely share copies of the original. So back to William Friedman. He too is fascinated and spends the next 40 years of his life trying to solve it. He puts together a 16-man team of cryptographers to study the manuscript, but they are rudely interrupted by World War II. After the war, they jump right back at it. What did they get? Jack. By the time Friedman dies, he gave up the idea that it was a cipher and instead believes it is a medieval attempt to create an artificial language. By 1970, cryptologists are using computers to help crack the code. The first attempt in 1976 doesn't really get anywhere. Then another guy comes out with the claim that he's cracked it and it's a Ukrainian theologic text. However, the pictures are completely unrelated. Seriously? In the 1980s, someone makes the claim that the language used is a modified form of Flemish and is the sole surviving document of the Catharists, a persecuted Christian sect that existed between the 12th and 14th centuries. But by this time, the manuscript has built its own community, and both of the last two claims are quickly destroyed by said community. Interest wanes until the internet. And like many other global mysteries, the Voynich Manuscript gets its own website where all information can be collected into one central hub. And I will have a link to that website in the description below if you would like to check it out. So that brings us to today. And I can hear you screaming at me out there, but what is it? And I hear you barking. And now would be a good time to kick back in your beanbag and turn on that lava lamp because things are about to get trippy. So here's what we know. The Voynich Manuscript is a collection of roughly 240 pages of text and diagrams with a guess of about 30 more pages that are now missing written in a language no one can decipher. However, just by studying the book itself and the many illustrations that are in it, there are a few things that we can deduce on our own. It's written on medieval parchment, also known as vellum or stretched and scraped animal skins, is divided into six parts. The first looks to be a study of botanicals or plants, which takes up almost half the book. Every page includes colorful illustrations of plants that are mostly unknown to botanists. There are a few that closely resemble some of today's common plants, like there's one that looks like a lily pad and there's another that looks like a sunflower, but others are wildly different than anything on earth today, like this plant with cubed roots. In medieval times, there were a number of herbal books written, but the illustrations were usually much more detailed and precise. The second and fourth sections are on cosmology and astrology. These sections are super interesting because within the illustrations are several recognizable zodiac signs written in a much more recognizable way that is pretty close to an old language once spoken in southern France. Now take a look at this drawing. For anyone who knows their zodiac signs, this is obviously Libra. And the text underneath looks very similar to the word October, which is, of course, when the sign primarily reigns. We also have Pisces, Cancer, and Taurus. The third section is Balneology. I know, I had to look it up too. It's a method of treating diseases or health problems by bathing or immersing someone in mineral water or mineral-laden mud. 
We may not hear much about it anymore, but back in the day, there were even published guides to all of the public baths and hot springs all around Italy. The fifth section is more plants, but it looks really different from the first section, which had one illustration surrounded by text on each page. The fifth section is filled with lots of plants and containers on every page. And the sixth and last section is what is referred to as the recipe section. Just lots of text with several stars in the margins that look as if they serve as bullet points or something. Now, some people have theorized that this is a women's health guide. That may not be too far off considering all of the pictures of women with things that look like pieces of the female reproductive system. And it wouldn't be a stretch to think of an ancient wellness guide as having astrological information since way back when, when you took something was almost as important as what you took. So let's go back to those questions we posed at the beginning. Who wrote it? When was it written? And where was it written? We're going to start with the easiest of these. When? Thanks to modern technology, carbon dating performed in 2009 has narrowed down the time it was created to sometime between 1404 and 1438. So early 15th century. Not to mention that the style of drawing and little details like this castle match that time frame. Okay, so that's the when, what about the where? The castle drawing included in the pictures suggest a Southern European origin, and the suggestion has been made that maybe it's more specifically Northern Italy. 15th century Italians used goatskins for their parchment, so they ran amino acid testing of the pages. Result? Nope. The book is calfskin. Unfortunately, Everybody else in Europe also used calfskin, so there's no way to narrow down what region it may have been written in. Same with the ink, super common throughout that time in all of Europe. And the paint pigments don't give us any more clues either. All they can say is that it was written somewhere around Northern Europe around the beginning of the 15th century. Okay, what about who? For a long time, it was generally accepted that a man named Roger Bacon was the author. Why did they think that? Because there was actually a letter written in the 17th century tucked into the front cover that said it was Roger Bacon. And Roger Bacon was a well-known English philosopher and natural scientist from the 13th century who, in his later years, gained a reputation for dipping his toes into things of a more magical nature. So it seemed like he was a good candidate to be the author of what looks to be some kind of natural scientific almanac or something. However, the carbon dating, putting the book at being created in the early 15th century, pretty much rules him out. And beyond Mr. Bacon, there are no other suggestions. We have no idea. So what about figuring out what it says? Easier said than done. The text has 22 letters grouped together to form words separated by spaces moving from left to right. Some resemble common Latin abbreviations often used at that time, but only some. Most are characters that nobody recognizes. Now, one gigantic head start to cracking most ciphers is to try to figure out the original language of the author. That will lead you to the patterns and quirks that are the hallmarks of any particular language. If you can figure out the base language, you can use those quirky patterns as clues. Another hint is to look for the distribution of small common words versus longer rare words. If that's the case, you are usually working with a real language. The most common word in the English language is the, which totals about 7% of all words used. The second most common is of at 3.5%, half as often as the. Ready for your daily dose of useless trivia? Amazingly enough, it seems that all languages fit the same pattern, where the second most common word is used half as much as the first. Huh. And you guessed it, the Voynich Manuscript follows that same pattern. 
and the number of repeating patterns across the page make it way more likely that this is a real language as opposed to some made up string of random characters. The next thing that linguists look at is spelling. English has a unique quirk where Q is almost always followed by U. And the Voynich manuscript is full of these spelling patterns, with some letters almost always being followed by others and some letters only appearing at the beginning or the end of words. Also, researchers look for keywords, words only used in specific places, and they noticed that certain keywords are repeated on pages of the same type, like words repeated on all of the plant pages. And as if all of this isn't weird enough, the book is written in two separate languages. The bath and star chart sections written in language B and all the other parts written in language A. And it wasn't just one author. A study of the handwriting suggests that one person wrote in language A and as many as four wrote the B sections. Now, there is one small section at the end of the book that some believe they have successfully translated, and that section would suggest that the manuscript is some kind of medical workbook. That translation seems to be from abbreviated Latin and medieval German and appears to be a recipe for a traditional wound plaster made of goat's liver. There's even a small drawing of a goat on the inside margin of the page. But this text only uses two of the characters included in the rest of the manuscript. Not all scholars even agree that this is a correct translation. Now, for sure, there have been plenty of people who believe that this whole thing is a hoax. Some think it might be the forgery of an English medium and occultist named John Dee, who seemed to have some kind of acquaintance with Rudolf II. And since John Dee was good buddies with a guy named Edward Kelly, who was also a medium and a cultist who had actually been busted and had his ears cropped as the punishment for fraud, some think this dynamic duo cooked up the book sometime in the early 1600s to sell it to Rudolf II. But again, carbon dating has put the creation of the book 200 years before that, so they're pretty much ruled out too. And it's not likely to be a fraud by Voynich himself, since it would be really tricky to collect enough matching, period appropriate, parchment paper on which to write the entire manuscript. But others point out the fact that there seem to be no mistakes. How can someone write that many pages and not mess up even once? Well, I certainly am not claiming to be an expert on calfskin erasers, but I actually do know something about this. I was fortunate enough to get a private tour of the archives at St. John's University, which is close to St. Cloud, Minnesota, where they were working on the St. John's Bible, the first commissioned handwritten Bible in over 500 years. And whether you're religious or not, this thing is gorgeous, but I digress. The point is that I learned that when working with ink on calfskin, you actually can erase. You basically just very carefully sand off the ink. Probably not the best idea for big mistakes, but it can be done. Of course, the last question I have about all of this is why? Why would someone go through all of this trouble? Well, encrypting text to keep the content secret is certainly not a new idea. It's actually been around since about 1900 BC in Egypt and was actually used by Julius Caesar himself to keep his battle plan secret. But were naturalists or doctors of the 15th century so competitive with one another that they would go to these lengths to protect their trade secrets? I mean, the stonemasons are pretty famous for hiding their masonry secrets, but even they didn't go this far, I don't think. So who knows? But there are plenty of people who do want to know. The YouTube channel Voyage Manuscript Research has just two videos that together only total less than 29 minutes, but it still has almost 25,000 subscribers. After the death of Wilfred Voynich's wife, 
Athol in 1960. The manuscript was inherited by Wilfred's secretary, Anne, who, in 1961, sold it to Hans P. Krauss, an Austrian book dealer, for $24,500 and half of any future profit. Too bad for Anne. That didn't work out a little better. Hans tries for eight years to resell it, but fails and in 1969 gives up and donates it to the Beneke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University, where it safely sits to this day, known now as Beneke MS 408. Its secrets as tantalizing today as they have been for the last 600 years. So I guess George Bernard Shaw is right. The only secrets are the secrets that keep themselves. This book is so trippy. If you want to learn more, check out the links below to dive deeper into the rabbit hole. But if you want to learn about another more mystical example of a freaky, otherworldly, indecipherable transcription, watch this video right here. This one's even crazier. Until next time, be careful out there. And I will see you here again on the in-between.